Chapter 9. The children are carried off. The attack came as a complete surprise. The pirates had sneaked quietly through the forest until they were close to the home beneath the ground. There they waited for dawn. Folk had learned this tactic from the Indians. The Indians guarding the secret lair knew the pirates were on the island, of course, but they did not expect an attack before dawn. They sat quietly with blankets wrapped around them, unaware that Hook and his evil band were so near. The pirates swooped into the Indian camp just before daylight. An alert scout uttered a coyote cry as a warning, but it was too late. When the stunned Indians saw the pirates, they leaped to their feet. A dozen braves circled Tiger Lily to protect her. Others ran to meet the cutlass-wielding pirates. The air filled with war cries, the ring of cold steel against iron tomahawks, and the shouts of fallen men. It was a gruesome battle in which many perished on both sides. However, the pirates did not let up their attack. Soon the small circle of Indians protecting Tiger Lily was all that remained of the tribe. Fighting for their lives, the Indians cut their way through the ring of pirates and escaped. Hook was elated, but he was not satisfied. It was Peter Pan he was after. The pirate despised Peter. True, Peter had thrown Hook's hand to the crocodile, which was reason enough to dislike someone, but Hook's hatred went beyond that. It wasn't Peter's good looks or courage that drove Hook crazy. It was Peter's utter cockiness. Hook vowed to smash the bothersome boy like a mosquito. Hook studied the hollow trees leading to the underground home. The openings were too narrow for fat pirates. He looked over his motley band for someone who could wiggle his way into the cavern below. In the meantime, the children had heard the sounds of the battle over their heads. They listened, frozen with fear, to the whoops of men and the clang of steel. Now it was silent. Wendy, John, Michael, Peter, and the lost boys stared at one another. The same question was on everyone's lips. Which side won? Peter gazed upward with a hand cupped to his ear. If the Indians have won, they will beat their tom-tom as a sign of victory, he said. The others cupped their ears to listen. A pirate near a hollow tree heard what Peter said and reported it to Hook. Hook grinned a devilish smile. He turned to Smee. Beat the drum, he said. Smee chuckled at his captain's devious plan. He beat the drum in the Indian manner. Listen, Peter exclaimed when he heard the victory tom-tom. The Indians have won. We can leave after all, Wendy said. The children said goodbye to Peter and made ready to hurry up the hollow trees for their journey home. But the pirates had other plans. They smirked and rubbed their hands as they waited for the children to pop out of the hollow trees. Curly was the first one out. He fell into the hands of a pirate who quickly passed him on to another. One by one, the children were captured as they stepped out of the openings in the hollow trees. Wendy was last. Hook removed his hat and bowed graciously when he saw Wendy. He personally escorted her to where the boys were being tightly bound with stout ropes so they could not escape. Wendy was surprised by Hook's unusual politeness and did not cry out even when she too was tied. Hook watched with pleasure as his men tied up the children. As Slightly was being tied, the sinister captain noticed something about the boy that nobody else had seen. Slightly's belly was swollen round from his, bell from his habit of drinking too much water. This could mean only one thing. The opening in Slightly's hollow tree had to be large enough for a man to slip through. If so, Hook could let himself into the home under the ground. Meanwhile, unaware of the battle above, Peter had continued for a time to play on his pipes. Then he lay down on his bed and fell asleep. As the pirates carried the children off to their ship, Hook tiptoed to Slightly's hollow tree and slithered down the hole like a snake. He stood behind the door at the bottom and listened. The cavernous room was silent. Hook peered through a crack in the door. He wiped his smirking lips with the back of his hand. Across the room, lying sound asleep, was Peter. His medicine bottle was on a table next to the bed. The medicine had not been touched. Hook knew at once he would get rid of Peter forever. Hook carried a bottle of powerful poison with him at all times. It was a vile, yellow substance he had concocted himself. He slipped the bottle from his sash and poured five potent drops into Peter's medicine cup. Hook knew that the moment Peter took his medicine, he would be rid of the boy forever. Satisfied that the deed was done, Hook slipped back up the hollow tree and disappeared into the forest. Later, a soft tapping on the door woke Peter from his sleep. The sound of tinkling bells filled the air. Peter smiled. It was Tink. He quickly opened the door. The tiny fairy burst into the room. Peter saw at once that she was upset. What's the matter, Tink, he asked. Tinkerbell told Peter how the pirates had captured Wendy and the boys and how they were at that moment prisoners on the pirate ship. 
I'll rescue her, Peter shouted. He hurried to get his weapons. He stopped suddenly as he passed the table with his medicine cup. I did not take my medicine because I wanted to displease Wendy, he said. Now I shall take it to show that I care. He lifted the cup to his lips. No, Tinkerbell shrieked. She had heard Peter as he raced through the forest, boasting aloud about what he had done. She knew the cup contained deadly poison. It's poison, she cried. Don't be silly, Peter said. He tipped the cup. Tinkerbell darted between the cup and his lips. In an instant, she drank the potion to the last drop to save Peter. She staggered backward. Already, the deadly brew was working. She settled softly on Peter's shoulder. Oh, Tink, Peter exclaimed. It really was poison. You did it to save me. He put his hand to his face. Why, Tink? Why did you do it? Tinkerbell raised herself to her feet and gave the tip of his nose a loving bite. She flew weakly to her bed and fell upon it. Peter poked his head into Tink's tiny room. Her light was flickering and growing faint. Once it went out, Tink would be gone forever. Peter began to cry. Large teardrops ran down his face. Tink whispered weakly. Peter put his ear close to hear what she was saying. I can get well again if children believe in fairies, she said softly. Peter threw up his hands. But there are no children here, he said. Then he thought of all the children of the world who were sleeping and dreaming of Neverland. Don't let Tink die, he cried out to them. If you believe in fairies, clap your hands. Tink sat up to listen for the children's answer. From all around the world came the faint sound of children clapping. Not all of them, of course, but enough to save Tink. Her voice grew strong. Then she popped out of bed. In seconds, she was darting around the room as bright and merry as before. And now to rescue Wendy, Peter shouted. He dashed to his hollow tree and in an instant popped out into the world above. The moon was bright. Peter wanted to fly, but if he did, his shadow would trail through the trees and disturb the birds. Their chirping would alert the pirates of his coming. He would have to sneak through the forest like an Indian. He was quite excited for this. Like every adventure, it would be great fun.